Good evening, everybody. Welcome. That, that's the fastest time to silence in Seven Science history. Awesome. I'd like to start out tonight with a question about what's the strangest thing you've ever found in your yard? You've ever found in your yard. I did my PhD at Penn State and 40,000 undergrads. I have some really fun stories about things I found in my yard. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I bet some of us can come up with something else that can be taped. <laughs> no one has ever found anything strange in their yard. Like, so there were these um, insects. I looked out my window. I, I'm up a level from the ground, and I, it was a sunny day, and I looked out my window, and there were just all these insects mm. just swirling up hmm. from the ground. I know it's not that uncommon a phenomenon, but I mm -hmm. had never seen it before. Hmm. Ultimately, they petered out, kind of. So I went down and looked, and there were these huge holes in the earth where they had you know, hatching and then That's cool. Yeah. Ants, perhaps? Yeah. I was thinking Eastern that too, yeah. New York carpenter ants? Well, they'll fly for a day and then uh, drop their wings. Ants. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Uh, At least if, that, if my rules thank you. Search was accurate. Thank you, Susan. Any, any, anything else? Weird well, stuff? I've never seen a spider with all the babies on its back. Oh, oh that's, cool. yeah. that's really cool. That's very cool. Beautiful. Well, I, I did my, my master's work in a salt marsh, oh, studying cool. salt marsh sparrows. It's a species oh, that cool. is well adapted to salt marshes, and tonight's topic, um, on the other side of the tide line, um, mm -hmm. above, above the water, so to speak. Salt marshes are essentially grasslands. They're dominated by these Spartina grasses, and I like to think of salt marshes as, as my backyard for mm -hmm. a long time. And I found some strange stuff in there. I did my master's work on Long Island Sound at the University of Connecticut. I had a couple of eclectic uh, individuals who used to drive golf balls at me every day. There's a lot of golf balls in salt marshes, and that's what I do on my free time is pick up litter, golf balls. And there's a couple guys who would try to hit me with the golf balls while I was out there finding nests and radio tracking birds. And, um, but the strangest thing I ever found in the salt marsh was a naked man. Dead or alive? Good know. question. Who, answered, who asked that? That's the best no, I was question wondering I've ever too. Asked that. You know, in retrospect, I should have realized he was he was alive. He was oh, alive. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. You know, um, and it actually ties into tonight's topic, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I didn't uh, plan to talk about that, but I'll I, make something yeah, up. I felt like it was my backyard because for three years, every day, I walked these giant salt marshes. And you can walk through them. At low tides, the ground is firm enough, and you learn how to walk across them, and you can navigate them. Yep. We canoed and kayak a lot on these tidal streams and mm. to get to the back corners of these giant salt marshes on Long Island Sound. Mm. And they're, like my backyard, you know, there are very few people. I, three years, every day, six months a year, walking out there. I think I met one person ever out there, and mm -hmm. it was this naked mm -hmm. guy. I mean, you just don't encounter people. They think, ooh, the salt marsh, you're going to sink. It's like the Everglades or something. Yeah. So uh, it came about because my field techs and I were paddling into this back corner of the marsh at high tide. And so the tidal creeks swell up with water, and you can really make a lot of progress. These marshes are elaborate, and it's this incredibly elaborate maze of tidal mm -hmm. ditches where humans in the past have dug these ditches, mostly pris often prisoners, to try to drain the water from salt marshes to make them more inhabitable for people to live next to. Mm -hmm. We're paddling to the back, and as we get up to this big tidal restriction, this big gate, um, is it a, devi a device that's designed to prevent water from moving into the marsh at high tide, and it's a gate that was pushed shut, and then when the water recedes during low tides, the water's allowed to come out on this hinged gate. Like a lot of tidal structures, um, this one was not kept in good repair and was quite dangerous. Imagine like the Connecticut River over there, a much smaller version of that dam, obviously, but with this concrete chute that water just blew through, where you wouldn't want to get anywhere close to, a small whirlpool at the top. And we knew that. We were there every day in this marsh. We come up to this tidal restriction, this place where we park our canoe, and there's this man. And he's crouched down on the grass, and he's hiding from us. Not a good sign. 
in general, mm, right? Right. And we can't. If the Chago Creek is about as wide as this, so we can't really turn this 16-foot canoe around and start paddling. So we start paddling backwards. Like I don't know what this is about, but it's not something I want to. And he jumps out of the grass at us and it starts getting our attention. At first, it was clear that he was going to let us pass without drawing attention. But then, as we were leaving, he decided to get our attention, and he comes running towards us in the salt marsh to get our attention, to get our help, we found out. Uh. And uh, he, according to his story, I'll just put that out there, according to him, <laughs> what he was doing was paddling a kayak in the salt marsh, got too close to this tidal mm -hmm. gate, started to be swept through it. Starts paddling, I can't even imagine. It's at high water, this is terrifying. It'd be like from the top of the room to the bottom of the room, just water yeah. and sticks and logs and everything. And he couldn't escape the current with his kayak, and it pulled him through, and the kayak went across the mouth and folded with him in it. And there are a series of bars. I don't think that's what those bars are for, uh, <laughs> that are right above. I think it's for some kind of old gate that used to yeah. sit there. They could tie it off. Yeah. But he told us that he grabbed onto the bar to avoid being sucked through the gate, and it ripped his clothes off his body. The force was that oh, strong. Wow. <laughs> That's oh. what he said. Oh, we gotta he find this guy. Yeah. He had nothing on, he was completely naked in the middle of his giant saw marsh. But uh, then he wanted to ride back. We said, you know what, we'll, we'll go paddle back and we'll call for help. You have someone we can call? Sure, so we did. Did you see prisoners dug ditches out there? Yes, yes they did. Yeah. yeah. Yes they did. You know, and these tidal restrictions that are in place mm -hmm. in these marshes are have effects on humans like this poor soul. Uh, they also have effect on the salt marsh trails that I study. And mm -hmm. we just published a paper a couple years mm -hmm. ago looking at extinction probability for mm -hmm. organisms that live in salt marshes. And as a bunch of math nerds, we made this gigantic mathematical model mm -hmm. describing tidal processes and modeling different projections of sea level rise over the next century. There's a species of bird, the salt marsh sparrow, and it nests on the ground in the salt marsh. And every day the tide comes in, it's just a thin layer of water. But the young have evolved this ability that even though they're not open, they don't have their eyes open, they can climb up blind in the nest to avoid mm -hmm. the rising salt water. And they can tread salt water for a while. And if the water gets high enough, they can swim and desperately hold on to the edge of the nest to try to stay in it. Mm -hmm. And they survive that all the time. Yeah. You have this 28 day cycle, and the nests are highly synchronous with the lunar cycle. It's every 28 days you get this big spring tide and then it's just a lake out there and nothing survives that. Mm. So we model what will happen under these different climate projection scenarios. Will there be enough time for salt marsh sparrows to be able to physically squeeze in a clutch, build a nest, mm. lay an egg once a day, incubate the eggs where they hatch and get the young out of there. And our results estimated that due to sea level rise and the fact that salt marshes, and except in a very few places, can't really move up into the landscape. Mm -hmm. They're surrounded by very uh, expensive property and Boston Post Road, Highway 1. <laughs> and I, if I owned a house there, I would not volunteer my house to become salt marsh. Mm -hmm. um, and those marshes can't move up into that landscape. Mm -hmm. And we estimated that salt marsh sparrows have a high probability of extinction by 2060. Mm -hmm. That's just around the road and it will go like this, boom. It'll get to the point we, at least our model suggests, mm -hmm. where it would be imp impossible for them to fit in a clutch mm -hmm. in that small window of time mm -hmm. where the water is low enough mm -hmm. to prevent their young from drowning. Mm -hmm. And that's on the top side of the water. And tonight I'm really excited to have someone talk about mm -hmm. restoration and perhaps tidal restriction. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start by talking about that. Oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And on the yeah. other side of it. Yeah. And, I, and before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, about tonight, and I know there's some folks here from Burlington. Um, are there folks here from elsewhere who have driven here to be set in science tonight? Besides White River Junction, like me. Brattleboro. Brattleboro, cool. fantastic. And Danville. Danville. Cool. And London Dairy. London Dairy. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, Great. Terrific. And I'm I'm very happy with this size of crowd. Yeah, it's you, good. You may know that it's becoming to the point where we we can't even breathe in this room where like last month we had a hundred plus people in here Eesh. and 15 people in the hallway and this room was filled and people mm. left and I, mm. I I am just want to assure everyone and people watching at home that 
I had been really trying to find us a home for Suds and Science in the future that can be accommodating and friendly like this environment mm -hmm. um, and that can hold a, a, a rate of larger crowd. Mm. Um, for tonight, I intentionally didn't advertise all the places that I usually <laughs> advertise to greatly reduce the number of people mm. to improve the experience for those of you who found out about it tonight. So congratulations <laughs> if you're one of the people that did find out. You obviously don't get your, <coughs> you know, you, have, yeah. you must subscribe to our newsletter or our email, email, yeah. email yeah. notice Great. or something, or Facebook maybe. Great. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, sir. If, I, I'd like you to just think about something, and if you want to approach me afterwards, my name is Jason Hill, and I am the host of Suds and Science, and I am a quantitative ecologist at a local nonprofit here. Mm. If you'd like to come up and talk to me afterwards and give me your thoughts, I'd love to hear them. What if we move Suds and Science to another venue, either in Norwich or in White River Junction, and the Suds and Science part, what if they were separated? <laughs> what? <laughs> the two, we have two venues that are good possibilities. Uh, what if the science was one segment of the evening and there was an optional pre-mingle, post-mingle event afterwards mm -hmm. at a local restaurant or establishment just next door, literally walking distance? Mm -hmm. um, what if that was an option? For Would the that, suds part. For the suds part. The suds, oh, we're, I don't think, you know, the suds implies casualness. It implies yeah. that this isn't a lecture. This is a place you should feel free to express your thoughts and ask questions and admit that, I don't know. Um, that's mm -hmm. great. That's what the suds is meant to represent. So just think about that during tonight's talk. And if you want to talk to me, Jason Hill, afterwards, I'd love to hear from you. Is that something that would just say, no, I'm done with suds and science? Or, yeah, I'd go to White River Junction, and I'd be mm -hmm. happy to separate the suds and science and have as an option. So, uh, do you have a thought, Rachel? Uh, about where to go? Or? Yeah, oh, oh, I yeah. explored I every yeah, single place in really Valley know. we could go. I don't really um, no. So I feel good about that. Yeah. But oh, you mean about the separation of science the and suds? Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Um, no, not really. I like the suds and science. I like the informality. It takes the pressure off. Um, but this is this is your thing. So right. yeah. So, well, uh, Rachel Thea, Thank professor you. and yeah. director of conservation biology yeah. and environmental Thanks. studies program at Antioch University, is going to tell us about the other side of the timeline yeah. and you. effects of restoration yeah. success stories on the other side. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as Jason said, I'm Rachel Theod, and I uh, am a faculty member at Antioch University, New England, which is a graduate school in Keene, New Hampshire. How many of you have been to Keene? <laughs> yeah, OK, great. Um, so you know where that is, the very southwestern corner of New Hampshire. And I first want to thank Nikki Kolbeck for inviting me. Mickey is a former student of mine and now a volunteer at VC um, with Jason. And so there was an opening in the speaker series. So thank you for inviting me. And thank you for taking a chance on me. I, I think maybe you didn't announce it because you weren't quite sure about me. <laughs> so, so I hope to not let you down. Um, I will say I'm not a novelist. So I'm a, little bit, I'm a little nervous about the story element of this. But I am a science educator. And I do consider myself a scientist and an educator. And I chose to work at Antioch so that I could be working with students and talking about and doing science and educating the public about science. Um, so hopefully what I'm about to talk about tonight will come through as a story. Um, we'll see how it goes. And certainly I've chosen one of my research projects that actually has the longest term investment on the part of myself and my colleagues and my students. And so it's really evolved as a long term story, a, a hopeful story about salt marsh restoration. So on that note, I'd like to begin with a question. So Jason, you really laid the groundwork very nicely. How many of you have walked in a salt marsh? How many of you have paddled in an estuary or in a tidal creek in a salt marsh? What are some of the things that you've seen? I, I don't think we can beat a dead man, but um, <laughs> but what are some of the most what are some of the most um, impressive things that you've seen or encountered in your walks or in your paddles in salt marshes and or estuaries? Yeah. Yep. Was it a sandy substrate or was it really mucky? Really mucky. Mucky, yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Masses yeah. of fiddler crabs. Ah. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, a diversity of the 
of the grassland. Yeah. And there's a lot of species out there, actually. Yeah. And, uh, yep. yeah. 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 I take my every other year, I teach a course on Cape Cod where my research is. And so I bring students into East Harbor, which is the study system I'll talk about today. And we just rock around with nets. And, you know, it's a, it really becomes a, a powerful experience because most of my students have never walked in a salt marsh. And so we just walk through the tidal creek, we walk into the lagoon. And we just see what we see. And we were there last fall, well, two falls ago, I guess it was now September of 17, September of 17, you know, and to see a sea scallop trying to evade predation by swimming away from you using propulsion, to see crabs scampering along the bottom, to see the siphons of clams. I think that people don't necessarily realize how alive the bottom of a salt marsh is until they really walk in the sediment. Um, and it is mostly safe. It's funny because for this, for this talk, I was doing a little bit of, bit of research about one of the organisms that we're starting to study in my study system, horseshoe crabs. How many of you have ever seen a horseshoe crab? This is considered a living fossil, so these, these animals uh, evolved about 450 million years ago, and it's believed that they haven't changed at all physiologically or morphologically in the last 200 million years. That's amazing. So I was, I was doing a little internet research about some of their ecology, just in case you ask me some hard questions. And, um, and I saw that somebody had posted in an online forum, can a horseshoe crab kill you? And I thought, wow, that's interesting, you know, this perception. I mean, these are, they do have these kind of spiky tails, right, these horseshoe crabs. So I could see how somebody might think that, but boy, I can't think of a more benign organism than a horseshoe crab, <laughs> you know. So it's so, um, so that, that um, just being able to see these organisms and really see, see, like you said, the diversity of these systems. So I'll talk today a little bit about, about the research that we have on Cape Cod and about salt marsh ecology. Um, particularly, we're going to be talking about benthic ecology, which is sedimentary ecology, or eco the ecology of the sediment. I'm trained as a, a terrestrial soil ecologist, but in the past probably 15 years now, I've been doing deeper work in sediment, sediment ecology, which has real similarities to terrestrial ecology, but also some important differences. And the way that I beca became involved in this aquatic soil ecology is really serendipitous, and I'll tell that story also, because it is part of my journey as a professional. Um, what I'd like to do is begin by, um, by adding to Jason's story about tidal restriction. And how many of you have heard that term before, tidal restriction? Yeah, this, this refers to the historical <laughs> restriction of tidewater moving from adjacent saltwater bodies like oceans and bays into the coastal or nearshore estuaries and salt marshes that we'll be talking about today. And this is a problem all over Western Europe, all over the Gulf of Maine and the Eastern US, that in the 1800s, roadways and railroads were built that cut off the exchange of salt water between these larger saltwater bodies and these nearshore coastal systems. And this really resulted in severe degradation of these salt marsh and estuary systems because when you don't have salt water inputs to the systems, you lose oxygenation, you lose nutrient inputs, um, you, you lose flushing of pollutants out of that nearshore coastal system, that estuary or salt marsh. And as importantly, you lose the source of propagules of salt marsh benthic organisms like crabs, like clams, polychaete worms, annelid worms, etc. So I want to talk about a system that's on Cape Cod National Seashore, my primary collaborator, that was restored partially in the year 2002. So this is called East Harbor. Uh, East Harbor looks like a lake. It's actually on the east side of Route 6, just south of Provincetown. So if any of you have ever been driving north on Route 6, in North Truro, just south of P-Town, just south of the province land sand dunes, there's a big lake on your right. It's not a lake, it's an estuary, and that's called East Harbor. You might see on some older maps, it's called Pilgrim Lake, but it's actually called East Harbor because it used to be a harbor for the fishing industry, for the cod industry, and it used to have a really wide opening at its northwest end that allowed large ships to enter the harbor to exchange uh, commercial fishing goods between Boston, New York, and Provincetown. In 1868, that large opening was, sh was closed by the, the building, the, the development of a road and a railway. And that resulted, like 
almost all of the salt marshes in New England and in Western Europe in severe degradation of salt marsh structure and function. So we lost our salt marsh organisms and we lost the functions that they provide as far as um, providing diversity and recreational and commercial shellfishing, good salt, ma salt marsh and estuarine food web ecology. So I'm going to tell you the story of the restoration outcomes of the partial restoration of that system in 2002 because my students, my colleagues and I have been tracking those restoration outcomes for the past 15 years or so. Let's show, I want to show a map first. So Mickey, if you could help. This is, a, um, this is a survey map, a U.S. coastal survey map of Cape Cod from 1836 to 1868. And what I'd like to just do is point out the original, well I want to point out this is the very tip of Cape Cod. So this is Provincetown, right? You can see these parabolic shaped dunes. These are called the province lands. How many of you have been here to the province lands? I saw some heads nodding. That's great. So you can envision this area. Um, and so if we were to head down this way, we would be heading down toward Wellfleet and back, door, back toward the outer, uh, the outer cape. This is East Harbor, the system where I work. This is the original inlet. See how large that inlet is from Provincetown Harbor. And this is prior to 1868. The survey map was developed to plan for the building of the railroad and the road, which is now Route 6 and Route 6A, which cut off tidal exchange between Provincetown Harbor and East Harbor. So um, we could turn this around for folks back here if you want to see. Again, this is East Harbor. This is the province land sand dunes. You can see this large inlet in the very northwest corner of the system that allowed this to be a functioning estuary in salt marsh until 1868. Okay, thanks. thanks Nick. So in 1959, um, the U.S. Congress designated Cape Cod National Seashore as a park to restore and preserve the cultural, natural, and historical resources of Cape Cod National Seashore, of Cape Cod, which then became Cape Cod National Seashore. One thing that's really important here is that we maybe think of national parks, national parks as only preserving natural resources or ecological resources, but Cape Cod and many of our other parks were charged by the U.S. Congress to also preserve cultural and historical resources. So when you visit Cape Cod, you have the opportunity to not just see beautiful, preserved, and restored natural areas, but also to see the way that these natural areas really preserve and support historical and cultural resources. And that includes, as far in the Gulf of Maine, shellfishing um, and the recreational and commercial shellfishing industry. So Cape Cod National Seashore has acquired all of these salt marshes um, on the outer Cape, the area of Cape Cod National Seashore, Oh, I actually brought some maps. Let me make sure that I have those. I'll have to, I'll have to find the maps of the actual seashore. But they have all of these salt marshes populating the outer cape, and they're, most of them have been degraded by tidal restriction that both Jason and I just described. Um, and they, these salt marshes are all in various stages of restoration. So they've been restored periodically starting around 1990 um, over time. And what's really interesting is they all have funny nuances. So each system has some funny nuance that has to be dealt with in the restoration process. When I was in grad school, I had a wetlands ecology professor who taught us that if you restore the hydrology of a degraded wetland, it'll come back. And that's true, I think, to a point, um, because what I'm learning now is that each system has such, such, um, such unique history, and some of them are so degraded that you can't just restore salt. You can't just restore salt water to the system. You can't just restore hydrology and expect them to be healthy. Um, sometimes this can actually be very damaging. So I want to talk about East Harbor specifically. This is East Harbor, which we just showed you on that map, um, and what I want to show you here is the road and the railway. This is the original inlet, and this is the road and the railway, which now cuts off tidal exchange. In 2002, Cape Cod National Seashore worked with the town of Truro, South Truro, to open up a culvert in the very southeastern corner, right here. I'm sorry for those of you who can't see this. Um, but please feel free if you, if you want to see the map to come around. They opened a culvert that's only six feet wide to allow tidal exchange from Provincetown Harbor into the system. And this was actually prompted 
by severe fish kills and midge outbreaks in 2001. So you can imagine, this is a hot spot of tourism. In the summer, the system heated up so much that macroalgae just bloomed. And the, the macroalgae, when they bloom, they die eventually. They sink to the bottom of the salt marsh. Bacteria decompose or mineralize them, and in so doing, consume oxygen. When oxygen levels decline, that's when you get big fish kills and lots of decomposing organic matter at the surface of the soil, and that's when you get midge outbreaks. And midge, they, midges, they look like mosquitoes. They don't bite, but they're very pesky, and they look like mosquitoes, and this is not good for tourism. Nor is really stinky, dead, floating fish in what looks like a lake that people are passing by on their way to get lobster in Provincetown. So the town of Truro said, huh, okay, Cape Cod ecologists, we need to do something about this. And this really, it's not to say that the Cape hadn't built, hadn't built um, social capital with the, town, with the town. They had, but the town is actually managing that culvert. It becomes very expensive to manage a culvert. But this midge, this midge outbreak and this fish die-off really prompted the town of Truro to support the restoration project. So in 2002, that culvert was permanently opened and ever since then, my students and colleagues and I have been following the recovery of the shellfish populations, the, sel the shellfish assemblages, and now, more recently, um, the predators of the shellfish, such as green crabs, horseshoe crabs, um, and other major predators, such as moon snails, for example. And now we're even starting to look even deeper into the benthos. So what was so interesting here is that in 2005, I had a student um, go into the system. Her name is Brett Thielen, and she currently works as the science director for the Harris Center for Conservation Education in Harrisville, New Hampshire. And she was really interested in working on Cape Cod because she had been an AmeriCorps volunteer on Cape Cod after her undergraduate degree. And so she was still really connected with the ecologists at Cape Cod, and they were seeing, okay, we have this culvert opening, but within the first year or two, they started seeing shellfish population. They started seeing shellfish in the system, saltwater invertebrates, within a year of opening that culvert. But they didn't have the resources to systematically study them. And I had just started at Antioch. I started at Antioch in 2003. I was working on terrestrial ecology, particularly soil fungi, cyanobacteria, and bacteria. And I was new at Antioch as a soil ecologist and trying to build a new research program, a research program that had my voice, my area of interest, where I was no longer kind of tagging along after a doctoral advisor. And so there was this really nice convergence of events where I was new, I was young, and I really needed, I also needed research that was not highly laboratory intensive because Antioch is traditionally a field-based teaching organization, which is why I chose it. But I didn't have the same resources at Antioch that I had had at Ohio State, where I did my graduate work. And so I was trying to figure out, how can I do my work if I don't have access to really expensive laboratory instrumentation? At the same time, Brett was in the conservation biology concentration, and she was talking with ecologists on the Cape who said, we need somebody to really systematically look at shellfish community recovery after this restoration project, after this culvert was opened. So she approached me and she said, okay, soil ecology, close enough. And we began to work together to really, uh, to sample the shellfish. And we started in 2005, which was only three years after that culvert was opened. And we found so many shellfish that year. We found multiple species of shellfish, many of them commercially and recreationally valuable, including cohogs, blue mussels, and soft shell clams. Um, the soft shell clam population was immense. We found 3,000 individuals per square meter. And those are small, they're small. We were really only sampling, you know, we were sampling all sizes above two millimeters in diameter. That's small, but nonetheless, 3,000 soft shell clams per square meter in this system. It was a fast recovery and it was a boom of soft shell clams. And so that was really interesting and that was, um, that was our first sampling year. One thing that Brett also wanted to do, which is really relevant to VCE, is that she wanted to incorporate citizen scientists into the project. And so she had a citizen science aspect to her project where she, she brought some citizen scientists onto the project because many people come to the Cape for a season 
and they really want to contribute to the park initiatives. Um, they want to volunteer in some way. And so she had a small group of, of citizen scientists come out and sample shellfish to, to count them by species. And she compared their data to data that were generated by a shellfish professional who knew how to identify shellfish species. And what she found was that as long as the citizen scientists are trained adequately, that there was no significant difference in the quality of their data between citizen science collected shellfish data and professional shellfish scientist collected data, which was really promising. And so that was an, a nice output of her study. So what happened after that is um, I had built some nice networks with Cape Cod National Seashore Ecologists. We wanted to continue studying shellfish recovery at the site. We were particularly interested in this boom of soft shell clams. But interestingly, what happened next was that in 2005 and 2006, we had severe macroalgal blooms in this area of the marsh, which is called the lagoon. This is what looks like the lake. <laughs> if you're driving up to Provincetown, it's six feet deep. It's not that deep, but it's, it's, it's salty. It's brackish. And so we had severe macroalgal blooms that again resulted in stinky um, uh, uh, fish kills. And so we had more fish kills, again, as the result of deoxygenation of the water as those algae were mineralizing or decomposing at the, at the bottom of the water. Um, and at this time, I was talking with my colleague who works on Cape, Cape Cod National Seashore. His name is Steve Smith. He's their aquatic ecologist. And, and uh, you met him on our trip, right? And he got to thinking, he said, you know, I've been reading these papers about zebra mussel, mussel invasion in the Great Lakes. And what was being observed in the Great Lakes was that where zebra mussels were invading, they were contributing macronutrients to the sediment and to the water, clarifying the water column via their filter feeding activities, and thereby facilitating macroalgal blooms. And he thought, I wonder if the same thing is happening in East Harbor. And so we tested it. So for the next three years, between 2009 and 2011, we had three students do mesocosm exper experiments in a local greenhouse. And those mesocosm exper experiments, what we did is we took sediment from East Harbor and we seeded these 10-gallon aquaria with, these, with this sediment. And then we seeded a subset of those aquaria with soft-shell clams, adult soft-shell clams, maybe three or four inches long. Some of the aquaria we didn't seed with clams at all. And some of the aquaria, we actually um, added grazers. But the first two years, we didn't add any snails. We just had these two treatments, clams and no clams. And, and we measured macroalgal biomass in each replicate in those two treatments. We also measured the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus both in the sediment and in the water column. And what we observed was very stark. In mesocosms with clams, we saw significantly higher nitrate and ammonium, which are inorganic forms of nitrogen, which make algae grow, and significantly higher phosphorus, which also makes macroalgae grow. We actually have a picture that shows little tins, um, maybe six or eight tins, no clams, clams, those two different treatments, and the tins with clams have so much more macroalgae. And that, that was, a picture tells a thousand words. We didn't even need stats. Of course, we did them. But you, know, you can see the result. And there's another piece to this puzzle here. Well, first, let me, let me say this. That was really, it was very interesting. Because we think, wow, it's good that we have, it's good we have clams. We want clams. Clams are good. But in this case, it was too much of a good thing. And it, it's, it goes back to this idea that it's not simple. It wasn't simple to just say, oh, we have clams and now restoration is underway. The system was still in disequilibrium and needed, it was in the process of equi equilibrating into a sustainable system. Um, so all of those clams, we said, are probably really contributing to these macroalgal blooms. But there was another piece to the puzzle, and that is this. We call this a partial restoration because there's a culvert open under Route 6 but there's a road right here called High Head Road that goes up onto this scarp, this glacial scarp. And th there's another culvert, a second culvert. So there's a salt marsh here, and then there's another constriction here. So this entire lagoon, this six foot lagoon, this 280 hectare lagoon has another constriction. It's a culvert and it's open, but it's small. So Provincetown Harbor is over here. And we're trying 
to get tidal fluctuation in the lagoon to be sufficient enough to have all of those effects that I described earlier, oxygenation of the water, bringing nutrients into the system, flushing pollutants out of the system, um, and bringing, of course, propagules of salt marsh species, both plants and animals, into the system as well. Well, because we have this other tidal constriction under High Head Road, the lagoon heats up in the, in the summer. And so Steve Smith, around this time, 2009, 2010, when we were getting our results in these mesocosm experiments, he was conducting a, a complementary experiment and this, again, was in the lab. And what he did is he heated up water in mesocosms, and he saw how well algal grazers, like periwinkle snails and mud snails, were able to survive in high water temperatures, as high as the water temperatures get in the lagoon in July and August, which are about 30 degrees Celsius. That's warm. And it gets warm because there's not enough tidal flushing. And what he found is that these macroalgal grazers, which are really common in the salt marshes all over the Gulf of Maine and keep macroalgal populations and biomass in check, were dying in these mesocosms with high, high, high water temperatures. And what they had also observed, ecologists that were working regularly on the Cape, is that the lagoon was bereft of these macroalgal grazers. So Steve was able to put the pieces together and say, oh, it's too warm in the lagoon for these macroalgal grazers to survive. So we had a restoration in 2002, a boom in lots of, uh, lots of uh, shellfish, bivalve shellfish, and especially in these soft shell clams, but we didn't have any macroalgal grazers to keep, use a top-down mechanism to keep those macroalgal um, blooms in check. And so we were getting those blooms. As a result of those blooms in 2005 and 2006, we had a massive shellfish die-off. So I had students out there, Erica Kidd, Jody Wenimer, Vicki Rubino. They were out there also measuring, um, measuring shellfish communities over time between 2005 and 2013 about. So we have lots of data. And we saw that they, their die-off was really profound, but that they were still there. And they were still maintaining, um, they were still maintaining populations. They just weren't as, as highly, uh, highly populating. At the same time, we added algal grazers to the lagoon because we needed that part of the system there. And they're doing OK. Mud snails, in particular, are doing well in the lagoon. Um, it's still warm, but mud snails tend to be more tolerant of extreme temperatures than periwinkles do. And so they are now in the lagoon keeping macroalgal populations in check. However, we still see in the system that macroalgae have the highest primary productivity of any plant there, which is not good. Because what we really want there is eelgrass and widgeon grass, which are really important submerged aquatic vegetation for shellfish and for finfish. Um, Wigeon grass and eelgrass are there, but they've had to be planted primarily, especially the eelgrass. And we still are seeing a lot of macroalgae because we still don't have a lot of tidal exchange in the lagoon. We still have that, tidal that second tidal restriction under High Head Road. What is promising in the system is that we are starting to see now major predators of shellfish come into the system. And that's telling us, OK, this is, this is, there's probably going to be a nicely functioning estuarine and salt marsh food web developing. We see more moon snails. We see more horseshoe crabs, um, which I just showed you, and they can't kill you. Um, and, and we are also seeing now the European green crab. Has anybody ever heard of the European green crab? Yeah, this is a, what we call this a voracious predator. I actually used the term in a paper, vor, green crabs are a voracious predator on bivalves. And one of the reviewers was really defensive, you know. He said, you can't call it voracious. It's just doing what crabs do. And I think that was true. I think, I think that was right. So I took it out. Um, but they are voracious predators. And they're invasive. And they're also very common in salt marshes all over New England. And we're starting to see them as well. So um, subsequently, we're doing a lot more studies. We're doing a lot more studies of, um, of these predators and their effects on, on the bivalve population. So I had a student, Heather Conkerton, do another mesocosm study in 2013, where she actually studied the feeding preferences of these green crabs. So she had mesocosms with green crabs, um, and she had different assemblages of cohogs and softshell clams in each of these mesocosms, and she took videos. 
she, what she would do is she would get the green crab, she'd take it out of East Harbor and she would starve it for 24 hours. If this makes you feel bad, I'm telling you, there are lots of green crabs in the world, so <laughs> it's fine. So she would starve it for 24 hours and then she would put them in the mesocosm and so she would take video of what they ate. You know, did they choose cohawks? Did they choose soft-shell clams? What did they choose? If they chose cohawks, how big? If they chose soft-shell clams, how big? And what she found is indeed they do, they do prefer soft-shell clams because soft-shell clams are easier prey because they have softer shells. Um, she also dissected their stomachs, which was really cool. So this was, you know, a feeding, a feeding preferences study, and she was able to find all the different sort of annelid material and polychaete material and shell material and even algae that they were eating. So we were able to see, ah, okay, yeah, they're eating a lot of stuff in this system. And that was really interesting um, as well. So now where are we? Um, where we are now is that this baseline research that we've done to look at shellfish restoration in the system and now that we're seeing these, these predaceous invertebrates come into the system and we're really starting to see it equilibrate. Um, we've now finally been able to convince the Park Service that we need to have more money to do the work. And so, um, and so this is actually a testament to the, the value of long-term investment and investing for you know, 10 years in, in kind of unfunded research has given the Park Service uh, reason to now support two projects. One in which we sample the benthos, not just for shellfish, but for all macro in fauna, anything over one millimeter large. And this includes shellfish that are small, but it also includes uh, polychaetes, which are a type of worm, nematodes, which are also a type of worm, annelids, a type of worm, um, and, uh, and any, any other shellfish that are in the benthos. And these are really the basis for the estuarine and salt marsh food web. These are food, these are organisms that are eaten by both invertebrates and vertebrates. And they also have a, another really interesting function, which is that they, they're called bioturbators. They bioturbate the sediment, and in so doing, they remove pollutants, they oxygenate the sediment, they move sediments from one place to another. You described walking in very mucky, mucky areas, it's really, it's shown that those mucky areas don't really support invertebrate ecology. They don't support invertebrates very well. Most invertebrates, including horseshoe crabs, really need sandier sediment in order to lay their eggs and for their, um, their juveniles to actually to grow and develop. And so they have really important functions in the food web and in creating healthy sediment, healthy sedimentary soils. Um, so we're doing that work, and I have, what I've done is I've brought some samples that we're actually getting from, what we do is we, we take a grab of sediment, several hundreds of grabs all summer, <laughs> um, and this right now is being conducted by Tabitha Meyer. She worked with, with me last summer, and now I'll have some more Antioch students. My main collaborator on this is Sophia Fox. She's the aquatic ecologist at Cape Cod National Seashore. So I do have some, some small, critters uh, that we've gotten, some periwinkle snails, some polychaetes, um, as well as some surf clams, so later if you want to come see what we're gathering in the sediment. But we're also still collecting big bivalves. This is an eastern oyster, and this is big. It's big both literally and figuratively because we're starting to see big commercially and recreationally valuable bivalves. And so the whole goal now of the project is really to hopefully show that we're getting a really viable uh, food web and a sustainable, sustainable populations of recreationally and commercially valuable shellfish, like soft shell clams, quahogs, and oysters. And so we can't yet open the system to recreational shell fishing until we know whether these populations are actually sustainable. And to do that, we need to know what's there and where, how they're distributed, how abundant they are, and, and we need to know their different life stages. Do we have enough small ones that if we take the, the, the harvestable ones, that they can actually re replace, um, the, is, there, is there good replacement population ecology? And that's part of the reason we're looking at the smaller ones now to get, to do some modeling, population modeling. We're also now looking at habitat modeling. So where are these organisms? Where are they likely to be based upon sediment characteristics, water column characteristics, and submerged aquatic vegetation distribution? 
The second project that now the National Park Service is interested in is looking at horseshoe crab population ecology in the system. They weren't there at first. It took them a while to get there. And I had two students work on this project a couple years ago, Crystal House and Jody Curtin. And they spent the entire summer out there looking, looking for horseshoe crabs, capturing them, measuring their prosomal width, in other words, their shell width, tagging them. Um, for the Fish and Wildlife Service long-term population study of the Gulf of Maine horseshoe crabs and looking for spawning beaches. Where were they spawning? And where are areas in he East Harbor along the lagoon that are favorable for spawning? And what they found, we just very preliminary results, suggest that we have a really strong, healthy population of horseshoe crabs in East Harbor. And we don't even know if they're leaving. They may be overwintering in the estuary. And this is, this is really interesting and really important because horseshoe crabs are vulnerable. They're considered, they're globally vulnerable and locally in some areas even more than vulnerable. Um, a recent paper studied, uh, excuse me, published in 2017 suggests that we can't technically call them threatened yet, but that in the Gulf of Maine and in other areas along the east coast of the United States that they are locally very um, at risk. And that's because of habitat loss, some of which Jason talked about, development, on the hab development along shoreline habitats. But in the case of New England populations of horseshoe crabs, primarily um, it's, it's, they're being taken for the bait fishing industry, for eel and for whelk. So they're taken as bait, and that's really reducing their population viability as well. So we're wondering, could East Harbor be a refugium for horseshoe crabs? Um, and if so, that would really, that would really um, shed light on another important function of this restoration project. So, so I hope this is a hopeful story of restoration. Um, this for me has been a wonderful way for me to have some uh, continuity in data and in learning a system. One of the things I've always been interested in as a soil ecologist is the relationship between below ground processes and above ground ecology. That is intimate and it's really interesting. So I'm, I've always been interesting, interested in the way soil organisms affect above ground productivity and biogeochemistry and global climate change. And now I'm working in an aquatic system where we're actually looking at things from a systems perspective. What is the relationship between habitat and bivalve population and community assemblages? What's the relationship between bivalves and their predators? What's the relationship between the system and the conservation of some of these vulnerable and threatened species, invertebrates that often we don't think about or don't value as much as we might value charismatic, charismatic mammals, um, for example. So it's a funny system. It has its quirks. Um, and it's been really fun to learn about those quirks over time and to actually be able to conduct laboratory experiments that help us to really understand the mechanisms for some of the quirks that we've been seeing since restoration began in 2002. Um, and I will conclude also that this research, I think, it's taking a while, but this research, I hope, will really convince the town of Truro. And I realize it's complicated and it's expensive, but I'm really hoping, and I think the Cape is also hoping, that in time, we'll actually be able to fully restore the system by somehow getting greater tidal exchange under this high head road, this second constriction where that, that separates this marshy area from the estuarine area with a very small culvert which cannot sufficiently drain um, or, or supply water to the, to, to the lagoon, what we call the lagoon. Um, so we're really hoping that the research informs a full restoration um, so that we can even bring this system into greater functioning as a salt marsh and as an estuary. That's my story, um, and I'm sticking to it. And, uh, and I'll <laughs> yeah, so please, any discussion or questions? What's the um, downside of increasing the culvert under the road? I mean, why is the town not wanting yeah. to increase it? Yeah, it's, I don't think it's that the town doesn't want to. It's just a very expensive project because they would have to really, I think they would have to reconstruct the culvert under High Head Road, and that, we're talking millions and millions of dollars. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know sort of their political position or their ecological position. The town of Truro has been very supportive of the restoration project, and the collaboration between them and Cape Cod has been strong. My understanding, which I think is limited, if you were to talk to one of my colleagues on Cape Cod, I think they would have a much better idea. But my understanding is it's, it's truly expense. 
Um, and then there's the issue of High Head Road being the only road up to the residences on that coastal scarp. So there's a marine scarp um, and there are several residences up there and it's the only access road. And so there are, I think there are probably some political implications as well, um, but that's, my, that's the depth of my understanding. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, what's the tidal flow in terms of height and uh, so forth? And is there any um, natural marsh within the, the lagoon itself that's developed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the tidal flow, as far as height, I don't know. The width of the culvert is about six feet, and I can say it's an intense tide um, coming into this area of the marsh in the southeastern corner, which we call Moon Pond. And that's the area, as Jason was describing in the marsh he worked in, that's the area with the Tide Creek. And around, and on each side of that Tide Creek are nice peat banks that were Phragmites australis, or giant reed grass, the invasive grass that comes in under really degraded freshwater conditions. The Cape has been actively, Steve Smith in particular, the plant ecologist, has done a lot of work there to reestablish native halophytic vegetation, Spartina, Sueda um, and sea blight. So glasswort and sea blight, he's really working on. And he's had some success in that area. Um, but there's still a lot of Phragmites, unfortunately. So it's patchy. You know, there are still some areas where the tidal exchange is too restricted to actually flood the Phragmites in, in, in higher marsh. In the lower marsh, he's having success. Um, in this lagoon area, it's about, it's about six feet deep. So it's primarily sandy substrate with eelgrass, some widgeon grass, mostly eelgrass. And then back here in the Northwest Cove is this mucky, sort of mucky, silty, clay sediment as well. Although we are starting now to see a lot of shellfish back there. Um, along here, frag it's mainly Phragmites and poison ivy. So this is all, it's just, it's really, it's dune-like at this point. It's nasty, it's dune-like. And it just, we just, literally, the tidal, the tidal, um, range in the lagoon is three centimeters a day. That's an inch. There's nothing. This is huge. And so to have an inch tide range is just nothing. It's just not enough, really, to get rid of some of the vegetation that we really need to get rid of. But we do have some sandy beaches um, in this area where we're starting to see some horseshoe crab spawning, which is good. Um, and then, of course, raccoons <laughs> and coyote, which eat the horseshoe crab eggs, right? Which we want, sort of. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. so commercialization, you have to develop a new system. Yeah, and in here in East Harbor, the goal is really to open it ultimately to recreational shell fishing, probably not commercial shell fishing. It's just too small. I don't think it could really support that. But given what's been happening to the clam industry um, all over the Gulf of Maine, even just having a small recreational shell fishing, relatively small recreational shell fishing site could be really, it could be great for tourism and really lucrative for the town of Truro. Um, so, you know, because people can buy one acre grants. They buy them by the year and, and that money goes to the towns. And so it, it, there are a lot of good reasons to do that. But yeah, at the recreational level, sure, it could support it, hopefully, eventually. Yeah. Yes, sir. And the yes, sir. Dunes there used to be um, really unstable, and they did a lot of uh -huh. work to replant. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Is still a problem, or is it erosion? Dune erosion. Sand uh, coming into the. Oh, I see. Um, you know, that's a great question. It's not in this area of the lagoon. We have really sandy sediment, a lot of quartz from that process of dune erosion, the prevailing northwestern winds um, moving sand into the lagoon, but not anymore. Mm -mm. There's enough uh, American beach grass. There's enough northern bayberry, and then of course in more developed new dunes, pitch pine, scrub oak. But yeah, it's really not. It's not to say coastal erosion is not an issue. It is, but at this at this area of the province lands, we aren't getting much sedimentation into the lagoon. So, yes, ma'am. So, um, it seems like repopulation and diversity in your ecosystem is happening, but it's still getting to 30 degrees in the water. In the yeah. So, are you actually selecting for more heat resistant oh, wow. forms? That's a great question. Maybe. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. You know, certainly, certainly more tolerant invertebrates and vertebrates will be there. Absolutely. 
And in some ways, this could be one of the reasons that, that this could be a good refugium for horseshoe crabs, because they're what we call urethermal. So you know they can survive at water temperatures, a wide range of water temperatures. And that could be one of the reasons that this, this site seems to be working for them. But whether we're selecting for more heat tolerant organisms, it's very possible. Certainly, yeah, and that's something we'll have to consider. That's a really good point. Yes, sir. Uh, looking ahead, as the Gulf of Maine warms, what is going to be the impact mm -hmm. of the project? Yeah. I'm, I'm talking decades. Yeah. Well, that's a great question, and you know, I think the answer to that depends upon the restoration, the management of the system. Cape Cod National Seashore is taking very seriously the management of this system. Um, and if that second culvert, the one that constricts inland a bit, um, that really constricts tide range in the lagoon, if that is not widened, um, if that is not repaired and widened, then likely what will happen is that the lagoon will become more saline and warmer. Um, well, it's hard to say, because if we get higher precipitation, it could be less saline. But one thing that we know, right, but one thing we know about the lagoon is that it actually is much more um, variable owing to climate fluctuations than owing to tidal exchange currently, because the tidal restriction makes the tide range only about one centimeter per day. So whatever climate effects are, um, whether we get more evaporation and therefore higher salinity, more freshwater precipitation and therefore lower salinity or just more heating, certainly there will be effects. Um, unless that tidal exchange is improved between Provincetown Harbor and the lagoon. Sounds yeah. like an interesting research project for the future. It does, absolutely. It absolutely does. You know, and one thing that we do when we are sampling for all these invertebrates is we also do take um, daily measurements of nutrient levels and dissolved oxygen levels, pH, and temperature in the water column. So we will have long-term data about fluctuations, both seasonal and annual fluctuations in those variables. So, yeah. yes, ma'am. So I'm very interested in these invasive green crabs. Yes. And um, a friend of mine who, whose family owns a place on the coast of Maine, has owned it for decades, yeah. said that now they have a lot of green crabs, but the mussel population is, is really crashing. Yep. Which I think is... Yep. <coughs> Is, is a disaster for either ducks and all the other yep. bigger animals. Yep, exactly, muscles, absolutely. Really important. Yep. To have some, you know, this invasive thing that can't be controlled, just take away the muscle, is, <coughs> is it gonna, what's it gonna do to the shellfish? You said they like soft shell clams better than... Yeah, they eat quahogs too, but they eat the younger ones. Um, it's a great question and we're interested in it. And if we had more bodies and more money, we'd be looking more deeply at the green crab problem. In fact, the woman I described who did the feeding preference studies with the green crabs looked at their stomach contents and took the video of what they were eating and how fast it took them to eat it. Um, these are some pretty cool videos, you know. I mean, how often do you actually get to see a crab eating a clam? It's really cool. <laughs> Um, she also tried to look at green crab abundance and distribution in East Harbor, but they're really fast. They're so, they're so fast. She ran transects. She tried to sneak up on them with a net, and they just, bam, they're gone. And so, um, so one... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yep. So one thing we're experimenting with, again, if we have time, bodies, and resources, is actually um, dragging a little uh, waterproof GoPro behind a boat and somehow trying then to extrapolate their abundance as well as their distribution in the system um, because we really do want to know how much they're eating and how many there are. There is, there, there, yeah, and they're decimating clam populations. Absolutely. They certainly are. And mussels, like you said. Um, I, I've read, maybe some of you have seen this also, as a result there have been articles about can we eat them? Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah it'd be great, right? And I think this about Phragmites too, my gosh, you know, why haven't we learned to like make linens out of giant reed grass or something? It just makes sense. But um, it, like lionfish, the tropical lionfish invasion is also a major issue and lionfish are really meaty and really yummy if you can catch them and you've got to spear them to kill them. The problem with green crabs is that they're not very meaty. They're very lean. 
and so um, you have to use them only as a broth. So chefs are starting to use them in Maine and in other areas throughout New England, um, but you have to catch a lot of them. They're hard to catch, and really they're only good for broth, and that's, you know, I mean, it's not like a lobster, unfortunately, you know? Yeah, it's a major, it's a major problem. Yeah, and then there's another invasive crab on Cape Cod as well called the purple marsh crab and this is also an invasive crab that they believe is actually now, it's, oh, it's actually, is it native or invasive? Do you know? No, I can't remember. Purple marsh crab. I can't remember. I can't now remember whether it's invasive or native, but I want now to say it's native and that it's just growing in abundance because offshore fisheries are collapsing and as a result, it's causing a boom in these purple marsh crab populations. And what they do is they eat Spartina grasses. So they, 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 burrow, in the, they burrow in the sediment, in the low marsh, and then, and then they come out at night and they're nocturnal. And Steve Smith has been out there at night and he can hear them clipping off the Spartina right at the base and just carrying it into their burrows. So they, they're killing the Spartina. So we're, that was called for a while sudden marsh dieback. Um, and it was a mystery. And now we know it's the purple marsh crab. Um, Sasarma is the genus. So if you're interested, you can read about that too. Uh, it's a, just another interesting problem, right? And, and how do we maintain these marshes, which are already so threatened, when we have these invasive species coming in and eating way more than their share? So, <laughs> yes, sir. So how widespread is the green crab problem? Is it from Florida to Nova Scotia, for example, or is it a narrow? That's area? a great question. I don't know. I don't know exactly. My instinct is to say that it's quite widespread and possibly locally more of an issue than other places, but I just, I don't know, you know, the geographic distribution on that scale without looking it up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you give me, I guess, a little update on what's happened in Hatches Harbor and maybe Chesapeake Neck? Yes. Um, Hatches Harbor or Herring River? Both, okay. Um, these are two other mar these are two other restoration systems on Cape Cod National Seashore. Hatches Harbor is up in Provincetown, and it's bisected by a mile-long dike. So one side gets good tidal exchange, the other side, all the tide exchange has to go through another long culvert. This side is doing great. This side, we still have a ton of Phragmites. It's still giant reed grass. And I actually had a student working there, <coughs> too, actually, to look at how to, how to get rid of that Phragmites and what would happen if we cut swaths of it and planted halophytes, Spartina and Salicornia. And it did fine, but it's a lot of work, you know? And you're beating back Phrag, it's like you're constantly beating back Phragmites. So that site is still called, it's still called restricted. It's still called Phragmites. The Herring River Project, this is very interesting. Um, this is in Wellfleet, um, and this is actually the biggest salt marsh restoration project in New England. It's huge, and this is actually a riverine estuary system. So um, this is where a, the Herring River um, moves from inland and empties, in, e empties out into Cape Cod Bay. Um, and this restoration project is actually moving forward. And so we actually now have architectural plans. We saw these on the we Cape. Were we were there. Um, Sophia Fox, the aquatic ecologist, met us there and, talk, and talked about the project. We actually have plans now um, that have been published in the local newspaper for a bridge over Herring River to really increase tide flow, to really get the tide flow back into that freshwater river system in Wellfleet. But the issue there is that there was so much fresh water sitting inland on that river system that it, the sediment subsided, the peat subsided so much, in other words, it compressed so much, that if you move salt water in too quickly, and this is what I meant when I said if you restore hydrology, like it's like if you build it, they will come. Well, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> because in this case, that sediment has subsided so much that when you put a lot of salt water onto the system, then you get ponding of salt water and you get what are called um, acidic hydro, uh, hydrogen sulf or sulf what are they called? Sulfide soils? Does anybody know? Sulfide soils. It doesn't. Sound like it smells good. It doesn't. It's, hyd it's hydrogen sulfide. I just can't remember what they're called, but it's hydrogen sulfide is produced. And they're called, they're called, oh no, acid sulfide soils. They're called acid sulfide soils. So what they're having to do is they're having to reintroduce salt water very gradually, a little at a time. And so it really, the, the the process of restoration is just getting off the ground. And that took decades of building social capital because 
the people who live upland in that riverine system, we're talking about private home homeowners, golf course owners, you know, and so the Cape had to do a lot of networking and really working with people in the community. It's a lot of politics. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a whole set of skills that biologists don't necessarily get and we need in order to build relationships with stakeholders who are affected by flooding. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's proceeding slowly. Yep, so any other questions or observations from your own experience? Uh, last question. Thank you for keeping time. Um, yes, sir. How will projected sea level rise affect your work, positively or negatively? <laughs> We're certainly Gulf of Maine. We're yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, my. Feet. Exactly, that yes. That That's a great question. And it, it kind of goes back to this gentleman's question about whether or not the culvert, the second yeah. constriction, yeah. is ever, yeah. right. It, it, exactly. And it, it's very interesting you ask this because even the culvert under Route 6, the one that was opened in 2002, is starting to collapse. And now the town of Truro is having to repair it. So they're actually in the process of evaluating bids for repair of the culvert that was opened in 2002. And they're taking into account sea level rise in, right, in the, in the planning process of repairing that culvert. You know, I, this is purely theoretical, my response, but my guess is, my hypothesis would be that it would be good for the system because it would flood more of the system and kill more of the freshwater phragmites or giant regress that we're trying to kill. But it's theoretical, and I'm sure it's more complicated than that um, because, you know, we're also dealing with dissolved oxygen and pH and nutrient levels and propagules of organisms. So it's more complicated than just water and flooding. But I do think that we are trying to flood the system. We're trying to get more water into the system. And so just on that level, I think it could be positive. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate it. <laughs>